Welcome everyone to part two of our dugout webinar series. Thank you for taking time out of your evening to join us to learn about water quality treatment and dugouts for fish. Uh, my name is Kelly. I work for Lakeland Agricultural Research Association. I'm very happy to have uh, Sean Elgert joining us from Alberta Agriculture and Forestry. Uh, he's definitely the, the go-to guy to talk about anything water. Um, I definitely love to use him as a resource. Uh, he's very knowledgeable and I'm really happy that he can come and present our dugout webinar for us. If you have questions anytime during the webinar, please either type them into the chat or into the question and answer section and we'll go over them at the end of the webinar. So I will turn it over to Sean. Thank you, Kelly. Thanks for organizing and hosting this. Uh, um, and I'm glad for those who are able to attend tonight. Uh, it's an important topic, especially at this time with the variable weather, um, some extreme weather we've been facing here. So this is part two of the uh, dugouts webinar where I'll be talking about water quality and treatment and dugouts for fish. And I'd like to run a poll just at the start here. It's the same one we ran in part one, but sometimes different people attend. So I'd like to run, if you could just uh, answer what kind of dugout you're interested in tonight, and you can choose more than um, one option. Um, last time, um, I wasn't, I guess I wasn't surprised. I was sort of expecting it, but it was the highest number of uh, votes for fire control for dugouts. So we'll just give a little time for people to <clears throat> answer the questions. And by the way, if I remember, it was around 40% that people were interested in fire control dugouts. So I'm not sure. Uh, Kelly will decide how much time she'll, she sees the votes coming in. So she'll decide and to end the poll and share results. And uh, okay, um, yeah, as usual, livestock watering is right at the top. and maybe a little higher than normal. And we have a healthy number of irrigation dugouts and uh, stocking with fish. And tonight I'll be talking about uh, dugouts for fish as well as recreational and household. Oh, and there's 60% uh, considering dugouts for fire control. So that's even increased since last time. Well, hopefully we won't need them for that, but it's good to plan ahead. <clears throat> Thanks, Kelly. Yes, so um, talking about water quality and treatment for in dugouts, most treatment for livestock is done in, in the dugout, what we call in situ. There are exceptions for some livestock, that's for poultry, dairy, and some other animals that require special care. Uh, treatment for market garden or greenhouse irrigation can be done, done in the dugout and at the point of distribution. And um, they uh, often use fertigation, what they call fertigation. So they, you know, get water quality tests done, not only on the water coming in, uh, but also after they add the nutrients or, and what level, so they can determine what level of nutrients need to be added. And uh, there are other, you know, a lot of the treatment information I'm going to be talking about tonight can apply to many of, of, other, of the other uses as well, but I won't be covering treatment for household usage. Uh, household usage or, or uh, dugout uh, or drinking water, I should say, is not recommended from dugouts, even with treatment. Some people, maybe if, if they're highly skilled and knowledgeable and do a lot of monitoring, may, may be able to do that for drinking water, but it's one shouldn't overestimate their abilities when it comes to treatment for drinking water from a dugout. But and you cannot phone me for that as long as I'm available to answer questions if you plan to do that. So um, in, in dugouts, nutrient buildup can occur over the years. A sludge will build up on the bottom of the dugout. This contains precipitated chemicals from runoff water and, and the treatment chemicals you use for treating in the dugout as well as dead biological matter, like weeds, plants, um, blue-green algae, can, uh, and even runoff leaves and twigs from surrounding bush can um, get into the dugout and cause problems. And also sediments carry nutrients, uh, 
uh, and also turbidity into the dugout, which causes problems. And these no nutrients promote the growth of algae, cyanobacteria, which is blue-green algae, uh, and plants. So here's a schematic, uh, new dugout on top where there's, you know, just newly constructed and there's no weeds or anything in it. But over time, uh, the weeds will grow in what we call the benthic area or closer to the sides of the dugout where it's shallower and the sunlight can get in. You can have floating algae near the top or at the top. And over the years, this, this algae falls down into the, onto the bottom and also sediments fall down onto the bottom. And it, it builds up year after year. And some people may not realize how much of a buildup can occur. You can use, lose a lot of depth in the dugout. And so your dugout becomes shallower, more prone to heating up. And also it contains a lot of nutrients. If these get mixed up, stirred up with some, you know, turbid action, a lot of, you know, water comes in and stirs things up, then, you know, it can release some of these nutrients again into the, into the water column. So every so often, a clean out of the dugout is required. So this is essentially removing the sludge that builds up on the sides and bottom of the dugout. And it really depends on the dugout, but perhaps every 10 years, uh, you may need to do a clean out. If your dugout is in a waterway, you're gonna have a lot more sediment building up more quickly as I talked about in part one uh, and more weed growth. And you're gonna have to do those cleanouts more frequently as you would compared to another dugout. Trackos are common machines used for this. Uh, and again, you're essentially you're removing the sludge layer as well as the excessive plant growth. When you clean out the dugout, you'll have, if you have water in the dugout, well, when you clean it out, you'll have turbid water. Uh, and so you'll have to deal with that. I'll be talking about some treatment called coagulation to deal with water turbidity later on. Um, a two dugout system, as I talked about in part one, can help with cl dugout cleanouts because you can transfer the water out of the dugout before you clean it out. And so you won't have to deal with water turbidity nearly as much um, you know, when, when you put the water back in. Uh, when you put the water in, try not to run it too quickly so you stir up a lot of sediment. You can have, say, a plastic chute um, with maybe rocks at the bottom to take out the energy as you're putting the water back into the dugout after you've cleaned it out. Um, and also sometimes, you know, the, the producer doesn't have an option uh, of, you know, taking the water out. You, what, you can just, pump, some people just pump it out onto the ground and it just, they lose that water. But sometimes they can move their cattle to another source. Uh, when they're doing this clean out and then they do a treatment on it to reduce the turbidity so it's palatable water again after after the clean out. So here's a picture of that cleaning out the dugout, removing that muck out of the dugout. You can see the pipeline on the ground there. They pipe the water out of the dugout. Now they're just working with a bunch of sludge in the bottom. Every so often I do get calls uh, about dead animals in the dugout, which is unfortunate. This can occur from them getting stuck in the mud for a, period, a long period of time or falling through the ice in the winter. So uh, the first step is to remove the animal, get everything out of the, uh, as much as you can out of the dugout. And then you coagulate the dugout. And I'll be talking about coagulation later on. Don't use chlorine bleach. This not only kills aquatic life and health of the dugout, but also can create potentially harmful byproducts. This is if you're doing everything with the water still in the dugout. And a lot of people, especially in time of drought, they need water, they have to deal with what they have. If, if need be, you can use chlorine. I would advise that you phone water specialists before to, if you do, you know, if you need to do this to kill any E. coli, for example, um, or harmful organic organism, uh, organisms, I mean. Uh, you can phone in just to you know make sure you do it right and if it's a proper procedure to use. As the saying goes, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. 
So you should try to do as much as you can to use the best management practices I talked about in part one to prevent the nutrients or other contaminants from entering the dugout in the first place. And so, you know, just some examples were grass, waterways, buffer strips around the dugout to prevent the, to filter out the sediments coming into the dugout. Um, and, you know, aeration, et cetera, culvert controls to prevent the poor quality water coming in. And again, a lot of those are found in the Quality Farm Douglas Manual. But sometimes if you're not able to prevent the problem from happening, and it, it does happen, people spend a lot of effort trying to prevent the poor quality water from happening, but sometimes it just happens. So then you have to take reactionary measures or what I call Band-Aid treatments. When you have to treat water in the dugout, problem water in the dugout, the first most important step is to identify the problem. Some people, a lot of people wanna to jump to the treatment part right away. So if they're talking to me, I always ask a lot of questions to identify what the situation is, what the problem is. Because without doing that, um, you know, you're just shooting in the dark. You don't, you can try something, but it may not work. And it, sometimes it make me things worse. So some of the problems that you can um, uh, come across uh, as part of the identification is our anoxic conditions. This is very low oxygen. And often in, in this um, state, anaerobic bacteria or de decomposing bacteria can uh, start um, growing and cause poor quality water, unpalatable water. Some cattle will just not drink certain types of water like this. Some of the most unpalatable water there is because they may not be able to taste toxins in, in the blue-green algae, which, which I'll be talking about, but uh, they, can, they can tell that this type of anoxic water is poor quality usually. Uh, also con chemical constituents from runoff. So the fertilizers, road salts, uh, herbicides, other, other chemical constituents can end up in, in, in the dugout from the runoff. You can also have dissolved organic content that's from leaves and twigs, water flowing through peatland and, and just water percolating and throw, flowing through the soil, the surrounding soil can uh, present dissolved organic content in the water. Um, and this together with the nitrates and the phosphates from fertilizers and other sources can promote plant growth, algae growth, and cyanobacterial growth, which is blue-green algae. Um, those themselves are also water quality problems, those growths. As far as identification goes, you can phone water specialists such as myself, uh, as we're currently available, um, to help with identification. But sometimes you do need to get water analyses done. You can get a standard chemical analysis. This, you know, some examples are the standard parameters such as uh, phosphorus, nitrogen, pH, uh, even, uh, well, not oxygen, but you, you, that's not on the standard, but you can get that in addition. Uh, but um, there's a number of these types of parameters um, that you can get a standard test for, but you can also get special sweets done as well. Sometimes, you know, a producer might be experiencing health problems with his cattle herd and they might have an idea. They may have talked to a veterinarian before and some things were ruled out, but they may have some suspicions. So you can get special sweets done um, with parameters that are not on the standard suite of testing. You can also get tested uh, for tests for biological organisms such as cyanobacteria. For cyanobacteria, which is, again, is blue-green algae, um, you can get tests for the cell, the cell count, how many cyanobacterial cells there are. You can get uh, identification of the species, so whether it's microcystis or anabine or other type of uh, species, and I'll be talking about this, this later, um, the species. Um, and you can also get tested for the toxins themselves. You can also get tests for E. coli done. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that feces related uh, bacteria. Uh, e. e. coliforms is the, or es Escherichia coliform. Cryptosporidium, I talked a bit about that in part one. That can catch like wildfire in a herd if they're uh, watering. 
directly out of the dugout and giardia as well, what they call beaver fever. Also, once you get your water analyses numbers back, uh, you can use the rural water quality information tool to, you can enter the parameters in that tool and I'll show the tool in a little bit here to determine the suitability for usage for various types of uses. And Kelly will be sending out an email with the website for this tool. And I'll just show it a bit here, some print screens of the tool online. This is an online tool. It's made, it was made for dial-up speed. So it should work fairly well. That's why it's low on graphics, but high on information. And so you can, you know, click to see the key features and how to use it, the directions link. And there's some sampling and testing information, what to get, what to sample and test for and how to sample. There's also a little bit of treatment information. It's would take so much to, you know, tailor uh, an online tool for treatment. So there's, we just provide a little bit of general treatment information, but once you're ready to use a tool, you click on the gray disclaimer bar, and then you eventually will come to, if you're using, if you want to assess the suitability for livestock, for example, you, you will come to this page. And, and by the way, for livestock, you, there's cattle and horses, poultry and swine, but there is also some irrigation, like for fruit crops, vegetables, uh, maybe a couple crops in there as well. You can select also. Uh, so here we've come to the livestock page and this is going to be selected later on for cattle and horses in the example. And there's a, some parameters that are entered here. Only the parameters are, that are more common and more problematic are in the tool here. And so you enter your numbers here. You have to enter a number for the TDS or total dissolved solids. That's a composite of all the uh, dissolved solids together. And then there's a legend here. They use, we use stop signs or similar to stop signs. And we have all the explanations. So green is pretty simple to understand. Green is good to go. And this tool is also for colorblind people. They can tell by the symbols alone. There's just one part of a report that's generated there was a parameter entered for fecal coliforms of 500 counts per 100 mils of sample. And we have general comments and guideline comments. Sometimes there are no guidelines. And so you'll see a blue uh, a question mark inside of a blue diamond. And so in the lack of a guideline, because they didn't feel it was necessary to institute a guideline or didn't have an in, enough information perhaps at the time to institute a guideline, uh, you, we give the best available, available information. And a lot of people still do have questions when there's no guidelines, so we provide that information. And uh, continuing on with the water quality and treatment, as, um, as far as plant and algae identification goes, the different types of growths are submergent and partly submerged vegetation. And here in the sketch and the picture down below here, we see cara which is a fully submerged, uh, actually it's an algae. Hydrilla, um, which is also, also fully submerged, sort of looks like cara, but it's a plant. These are, you know, growths are, that are weed-like growths. Cara is a weed-like growth, but it's actually an algae. And there's duckweed, which we, there's a, a sketch of it in the bottom left here. Um, there's a, it's sort of a tiny little four leaf clover, maybe five mil millimeters, the leaf in diameter with a root hair hanging down into the water. We call that partly submerged because the root hair is hanging down into the water, whereas the leaf is floating on top of the water. There's also emergent vegetation such as cattails and bulrushes and floating vegetails such as water lilies. One of my favorite natural flowers. Um, so I mentioned cyanobacteria. This is commonly called blue-green algae, which I'm sure many of you have heard about. Uh, the, the part cyan, the word cyan in cyanobacteria means blue-green. Um, it's not always blue-green. Uh, some, sometimes when it's dried, you can see the blue-green color um, more vividly. Uh, but if you, the one very simple test you can do, an important test that you can do, is 
put on a rubber glove and try to grab it um, in your hands. If it just remains like a slime on your hands, then it's not a filamentous algae, but it's a planktonic um, growth, which um, is most likely going to be blue green algae. If you, if you, there are other growths that may be uh, just slimy, but most often it's going to be cyanobacteria. But you can also phone in for help to make sure for to further identificate and identify what type of growth it is. But at least if you can grab it as a mass in your hand, you will rule out that it's. Uh, a non-toxic growth, unless it's a rare type of plant that is toxic, like water, hemlock, for example. But that's one very simple test that you should do. See if you can grab it as a mass in your hand. If you can, it's likely not a problem. If, if it's a slime, then it most likely will be a problem. So many species of this cyanobacteria exist, or blue-green algae. A very common appearance, perhaps the most common, is pea, a pea soup appearance, so a green pea soup. And again, sometimes when that gets a little dried and a little crusted up um, on the top, you can see a blue-green uh, color there. And sometimes it is always green. Uh, grass clipping appearance is also a common type of appearance. And I'll have some pictures here later on. And some, some people actually, about the grass clipping appearance here, um, one person thought that they were just mowing around their dugout and the grass clippings fell into the dugout, but it, it was actually cyanobacteria. Uh, continuing on with the uh, assessment, um, you can get tests for it in a lab laboratory, as I mentioned. You want um, you know, examples of labs, you can look in the yellow pages under lab laboratories and phone them, but you can also phone a water specialist. We have a list of those labs that test for cyanobacteria. I noted that one lab stopped testing for them because it wasn't much of, it wasn't a great business for them. So they stopped testing for it, but there are our labs that still test for it. Um, again, yeah, you can call, you know, us for not only for labs, but also to help identify, identify the species. Sometimes I can often tell what it is via pictures. I ask for, you know, close up pictures, uh, in a jar and uh, in the dugout without falling in the dugout, be careful. Um, and, and also one zoomed out picture as well. So a few pictures I usually ask for. And most of them I can tell over from the pictures. Temperature is an important factor for the growth of this cyanobacteria. And so when the heat wave struck, I got a lot of calls for cyanobacteria and afterwards as well, a few before. Uh, and I got more cattle deaths this year, most likely from cyanobacteria as compared to a lot of previous years. Uh, so, you know, this is something you need to be monitoring frequently. A percentage of these produce liver or nerve toxins. And it, according to tests in Alberta, it's a quite a high percentage. So microcystin toxins, um, is, is the grow, the type of toxin you will be testing for. Anatoxins, as listed in the last bullet, uh, have not been found in Alberta according to studies, but it's, it's potential. It grows in the US and other countries. So far, it's not been found in Alberta. So the only test available right now is for the microcystin toxin. Uh, there are, there's one more species I'll talk about that's not, that's a growth in your dugout that can be toxic, but we don't have a test for it right now. So that's the only test you can get right now. As far as the microcystin toxicity levels go, uh, we have what we call a no, a no observed effect level. And for cattle, it's 4.2 micrograms per liter. If you forget, you know, you can find the information again, but if you wanted to write it down, it's 4.2 micrograms per liter. I do get asked about that sometimes. There is no guideline for, um, uh, um, so, sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll stop that saying a statement. I'm gonna be talking a bit later about this. So here, just in the chart here, uh, that there is information for other types of animal species, sheep, pigs, chicken, and horses as well. And you'll see for pigs, it's a little higher uh, level compared to the rest of this, of the animals here. They can put up with, you know, more than some animals in some respects. 
And there's also uh, an approximate equivalent cell count um, for a no observed effect level. And uh, here's a picture of what is most likely microcystis, if I remember. It's the pea uh, green soup color. But you can see on the bottom edge here, you can see this blue green or cyan color here on the crusty, more dried out part. I noticed there's some blue heron bird tracks here. I wonder if they they left after that. They because I, I've heard many reports of birds just leaving, uh, you know, water bodies with toxic growths in them. Just try and click next. Here's another more close-up picture, not the greatest highest definition, but this is a this, these are very small particles, all just becoming very dense into a pea green soup um, color. So that was um, that, the last picture was those two could either be microcystis or anabina, just for to give some names out. It's a similar type of growth. This growth here, the grass clipping appearance growth, you can see some of the things that sort of looks like grass clippings, but this is a very dense growth. It started to clump together in big clumps. I don't know if I've ever seen a dugout this laden with um, cyanobacteria before, but you can still see the smaller grass clipping appearances here. This is called a phanazomenon in Alberta. It is found uh, to not bear toxins, but you know, and so the likelihood is if you see it, it won't have toxins in it itself, but it often grows together with other species of cyanobacteria that can be toxic. So it's best to take precautionary measures. Even if you get a test done at a time showing no toxins, it doesn't mean that in the future, it, uh, you know, the cyanobacteria won't bear toxins. So it's always best to take a cautionary approach. Here's another uh, type of growth. Uh, Nostock, I've seen it in a number of dugouts. It's a green globular shape and it can also produce toxins, microcystin toxins. So that's another species to look out for. Sometimes I just like to sit and stare at pictures. So I'll try to take my time and yak a little bit more. Here's another growth um, that previously wasn't thought as toxic, but I found out um, it can bear toxins. It has borne toxins in other countries such as the United States and uh, Australia. Australia is one of the foremost countries of cyanobacteria study, by the way, because they have a lot of it. The conditions are ripe there for the growth of cyanobacteria or, or blue-green algae. So we, in Alberta, we learned some things about what they study there in Australia. But this, this uh, species here called euglena is neither a cyanobacteria or an algae. It is a protist. It's a very interesting, interesting organism, the most interesting I deal with in dugouts. This actually is a picture from in the Barhead County right nearby me here. Um, that it started, so it's a protest, as I mentioned. Um, it can either gain its energy from photosynthesis, from the ultraviolet rays from the sun, or by enveloping an organism and digesting it. So it has, you know, more than one way of, of uh, getting its energy. It's quite interesting. And this growth here started in the bottom left picture. It started off as a bright lime green growth. And that's one difference um, visually from cyanobacteria as, to, as compared to this growth. It, from a distance, it can very, look very similar to cyanobacteria, but it has that bright lime green appearance. Sometimes it can have a different type of red appearance also. But um, in the top right picture, this same this is the same dugout, the same growth on it. It turned red. So um, it, it, the sunlight was too bright. So it turned red to shield itself from the intense ultraviolet rays. So it, they, it wouldn't be killed because ultraviolet rays are harmful. I mean, we as humans can you know generate uh, vitamin D from the sun, but also we can get have skin problems too, we can get burnt and even worse melanoma. So this is a mechanism where they've uh, developed to uh, shield themselves from the sun. And the farmer actually thought it was summoned through a bright green red paint, or there was a paint spill into his dugout is so bright red. 
So it was quite neat. And then it turn, turned green again after it was red. So it was, it was quite interesting to me. It was one, one of the highlights of that year. Um, yeah. So here's a close-up picture of the euglena. This, this is right on the top of the water. It's sort of a hydrophobic growth. It was sort of water repellent. Um, and so there were swimmers in the water below that because they have a flagella, they can swim. Uh, but this was sort of the more dried out, possibly dead part of the growth that you could see on the dugout. And you can see the bright lime green color. I, I uh, sometimes I joke that with all the Zoom webinars, um, I, well, I tried to use it as a green screen, but people started commenting about it. So I had to not use it as a green screen. Here's another growth called Pithophora. It is not, now we're moving on away from the cyanobacteria, but I'll, I'll be talking about the treatment of it later on. It's not cyanobacteria, it's actually an algae, a filamentous algae you can grab as a mass in your hand. But it, from a distance, it can look like cyanobacteria because of the fuzzy appearance as it floats, but it's harmless. Uh, another growth that is, can look like cyanobacteria, but it's harmless is duckweed and a lot, of, um, a lot of you I'm sure are familiar with it. Here's a nice close-up picture of the four leaf clover petal look of it. Sometimes there are three leaves in there. Um, and with the root hair hanging down below it. And this is a picture of it covering the entire surface of the water. It can provide shade um, and make a cooler dugout. And it also, if you remove it out of the dugout, like drag it out off, so off the shore so it doesn't wash back in again, then you're actually removing nutrients to the dugout. Um, but it's not good if it covers the whole surface of the dugout. You know, 100% coverage is not a good thing. It can plug pumps also in intakes where you have to you know, try to get the water from the dugout. So these plants do have an impact on water quality. If the blooms die, decomposing bacteria can, that, are, that are feeding and decomposing these, these plant or algae growths, uh, they can consume oxygen very quickly and deplete all, all the oxygen in the dugout within a day. If you have fish in the dugout, which I'll be talking about later, obviously that's gonna kill a fish. Um, but it, yeah, and, and it can cause water problems again. And I'll talk about this situation with no oxygen in the dugout. During the night as well, plants can consume oxygen and also deplete the oxygen in the dugout. Also, if the, these plants die, uh, the algae or plants or whatever they are, if they die in the dugout, they release, release nutrients for another cycle of growth. If you had a, a good type of growth growing in there and they died another worse type of growth like cyanobacteria, um, you know, could grow in the dugout. So you want to try to make sure that you're heading off problems like that. So here's, I was, I was gonna talk about this low oxygen. When, it, when you have a lack of oxygen, a low level, uh, anaerobic bacteria can start to flourish and they can produce byproducts that include hydrogen sulfide gas and other gases. So you get a swamp smell from it and also it produces black sulfide particles in the water. You can see in the pail there, if you look in the pail, the water is quite black. And this water can be very unpalatable. So you wanna to try to avoid that. Now, so that brings up the next slide, which is about aeration. One of the best values you can get for your dollar for improving water quality is aeration. And it can help in that last slide in the situation the last slide where it's black water it may not by itself be able to prevent that black water situation from happening uh, so you need to take other steps to you know make sure you start off with the best, best quality water which i've already talked about so it also it, it, during the winter when the ice forms over the dugout aeration is prevented like the natural aeration from the wind is prevented and often you can see you can get this black water happening in the spring after the ice melts off or and some often a heavy snow cover along with that where you know it prevents any aeration so um, aerating the dugout throughout the winter will help to prevent that but beware that uh, you see the the place where the aeration is happening there's no ice there or there may be thin ice so beware of that 
problem and you might have to have a sign or a fencing. Um, aeration also helps keep the chemicals precipitated out of the water because oxygen is one of the, is the most basic oxidant there is and it helps oxidize and precipitate some of the nutrients out of the water. It's not gonna be a magic bullet, a save all. It will help to prevent that, um, but sometimes it's just, it may not be enough. Uh, so there'll be, then there'll be with this uh, precipitation of chemicals, there'll be less, less nutrients for plant growth and it will promote a better quality water as compared to if you didn't have aeration and it will keep the anoxic bacteria from growing and that's important. Uh, aeration should be installed at the time of dugout construction. I had a schematic in part one of them, you know, you throwing the airline in the same line as the water line to prevent uh, freezing of the condensation in the line. And you should have an oil-free compressor so you don't add oil into the water. And also you should have a constant power for the aeration system. It should be running constantly all year round. And so generally the electric grid power is the more dependable power. However, solar power, if you make sure that it's the, the, you have no shorts or wire problems or battery problems, um, it, can be, it can do the job as well. The membrane diffuser, as we see in the pictures below, are the best diffusers because they um, produce tiny bubbles that dissolve more readily um, and more so into the water because you want this, these air bubbles to dissolve and become part of the water itself. So even in this part to the right here, um, of the right of the bubbles, there's oxygen that is part of the water itself that you can't see as bubbles. So this is a, a tube aeration membrane, and these are two discs here. Uh, you should note that if one of these discs is only, uh, you know, like four inches higher than the other, for example, you'll get most of the air coming out of the higher disc. It doesn't take much of an elevation difference if it's on the same line, the airline, to you know, pose a problem. So you've know, we'll got to make sure that they're at the same elevation. So here's a schematic of an aeration system. If you, this is the middle of the dugout where it's cut off here. So if you have your aeration system in the middle of the dugout, it'll create a, a current that will um, turn, cycle the water over in the dugout like this so that all of the water, most of the water can be exposed to these oxygen bubbles. And so this, this cycle here is also happening um, on the other side of the dugout going the other way. And here we see the airline coming out the side of the dugout into the compressor shack. As well, aeration um, reduces thermal stratification. So during the seasons, uh, for example, in the hot summer, um, the top, the, the surface of the water is warmer than the bottom, cooler part of the water. And when it comes to the winter, the top of the water, you know, fall and winter, the top of the water um, becomes cooler than the bottom of the water, which is warmer. And each of those seasons, there can be a turnover of the water. And when this turnover happens, the, all, the warm water comes to the top. This can produce turbidity in the dugout and reconstitute some of these chemicals that are in the sludge layer onto the top. So if you aerate the dugout, it will help reduce this turnover for this and this it'll and the thermal stratification which leads to turnover and this can uh, be a big occurrence in lakes um, for example there can be you know a huge a huge a lot of currents that that turn over in lakes that uh, bring up some of the sludge and nutrients so moving on to treatment of cyanobacteria there are liquid copper products now that are most uh, prominent for uh, as far as copper products go liquid compared to granular um, for treatment of a cyanobacteria. I try to, a lot of people want to use copper sulfate, for example, which most copper sulfate granular products are not registered anymore. And I'll talk about that, that later, but, um, but copper, I try to stay away from as, as much as possible when I recommend treatment for cyanobacteria. And it's the only time I would recommend treatment is for when there is cyanobacteria. Um, because it is uh, harmful to aquatic organisms, 
and there are other methods you can use, but but I I do often, you know, in a lot of cases do recommend copper. This um, this you can do, you know, whole dugout treatments, or you can do spot treatments, or you can do the top meter of the dugout. Try to limit the copper into the dugout as much as possible. Um, so if the wind has blown all the cyanobacteria or blue green algae to one corner or one end of the dugout, you can treat um, in that area with the copper so as to not over apply the, the, the amount of copper. And uh, I've heard many stories of people throwing in whole bags of granular copper sulfate, a gross over application of, uh, of the product. You know, often maybe a half a kilogram is required for the whole dugout even, the, or the top meter of the dugout. And that's sort of like for standard size of dugout. And even less if you're, you know, treating at one end of the dugout. So just be aware that, I mean, a lot, there's a lot of people over applying copper in the dugouts. Also uh, the different products of copper as, that use, that is the active ingredient, they use various percentages of the copper. So you wanna be sure you're calculating that out. I can, at this time, I can help with calculations for that. Um, some products may have it listed. Uh, well, the, the liquid copper products will have a label um, on the product itself of how to apply it. But often the bags do not have a label like that. And there's only one, I'll be talking about this later, but there's only one granular product available right now. And I think I have a slide about that later. When, if you use copper, you have to remove the cattle for at least three weeks after using the product because copper will lease or break the cells open releasing all the toxins at once. At this time, it's very dangerous. Uh, the water can be highly toxic at this time, um, but over the three weeks, the ultraviolet rays will degrade, will um, destroy the toxins that have been released. And uh, then at the end of three weeks or a month, um, then um, you know the water can be used again. Um, within a month, uh, I've heard stories that cyanobacteria can regrow. So I want I usually recommend to follow up with coagulation to remove the nutrients afterwards, which I'll talk about coagulation uh, afterwards. So so treating treating with copper will, uh, as I call it, nuke the the cells and release the nutrients for another potential cycle of regrowth, which has happened. So that's why I advise to follow up with coagulation. As I mentioned, copper is toxic to living organisms. So you wanna try to avoid as much as possible and, and no, not over apply and reduce where you can the amount of product used. Uh, as I mentioned, most, well, I, I'll, I'll amend this second bullet a little bit. Most granular products are no longer registered by the PMRA, which is the regulatory association. Um, for these types of products. And I do have a current, the, the Federated Co-op does have one of their copper product products. So if you know the co-ops that are around where you live, they do potentially have a, a, the one product, but you may have to ask them to order it in, but they're the only ones that have the, these types of granular products that I'm aware of for sale right now. And so, yeah, if you contact your local uh, co-op you can ask them about that but you can also call me for the the name of the product because they have one other copper product there as well um yeah but most of the registered products these days are the liquid copper forms and again i have context for contacts for who so sells those products today um so these liquid uh forms that are registered they're a chelated form that they, it stays in suspension longer and it's more effective. So it requires less copper uh, to, to be used. And so that's why they're allowed to be used in dugouts because they're, they um, are more effective requiring less copper. Some of the names of the products, of these liquid products are Qtrin Plus, Algae Boss, Polydex, and Think Purity. If I ever say that name, think purity over the phone, I have to repeat myself a few times and spell it out. I hope, I wish they would have chosen a different name. So now um, I'm gonna follow up with co coagulation now. 
So this is a, a follow-up treatment for copper, copper that can help remove uh, uh, you know, the nutrients of the dugout. However, it can be used by itself for treatment of, of cyanobacteria, uh, but I would more recommend it, you know, go with copper first and then follow up with hydrated lime or another coagulant. So this hydrated lime can uh, kill the cells and lock the cells. They, they don't break the cells open. So this, the toxins, if they are in there, remains in the, remain in the cells until they slowly degrade on the bottom. So it, it locks the weight, the, it, it pulls the cells down to the bottom of the dugout on the sludge layer and locks them away there while they slowly degrade. Studies have shown that um, toxins are, you know, effectively reduced, but if there is some turbidity in the dugout and the sludge is, uh, you know, brought back into the water column, it's, a, it's potential that some of that, those toxic cells for a period of time could come back into the water column. So that's why it's a good idea to treat with copper first. Uh, but with hydrated lime, many algae are, so sorry, yeah, so I should say many algae are resistant to copper. So this is the filamentous algae that you can grab as a mass in your hand, the weed-like growth. Um, so you do not want to use copper for that. A lot of people do think copper is a, you know, uh, do all, you know, magic bullet treatment, but it, it isn't. Uh, so try to stay away from copper as much as you can. So hydrated lime can be effective for, uh, filamentous algae that we'd like growth. Make sure you catch it early on. Don't wait till it gets to be an established growth because then treatments may not be effective on it. And so again, as I mentioned, this hydrated lime uh, is good for reducing nutrients to prevent another growth, a regrowth, and as well as directly killing the algae. But you, you should identify the algae before you prescribe any treatment, as I talked about before. Identification is the first most important step so that you can properly select the right treatment. So in general, um, I'll talk about coagulants now. Hydrated lime was one of the coagulants that can be used for uh, cyanobacteria or blue-green algae. But um, aluminum sulfate is also another coagulant effective at reducing nutrients. And they have their strengths and weaknesses. I think I'm, just give me a second. Yeah, I have it in the next slide. So I'll talk about the strength and weaknesses in the next slide. But um, so hydrated lime drives the pH in one direction and aluminum sulfate uh, in the other direction. And they have, you know, some strengths to each of them. So they could use, be used as a separate one-two punch. Uh, and, and at the end, balance the pH so it's not swung off to either too basic or too acidic. Also, a coagulant that's very effective is ferric chloride or ferric sulfate. Uh, and not a lot of people use this, but it is available. And, uh, you know, people should be aware that it's, it's available to, you know, there may or may not be a label with how, how much to use. So you would have to phone a water specialist to how, for how to apply it and how much to use. But um, you can see in the picture here, one method of, of app applying it in is uh, using basically a fire hose nozzle. You, you mix the powder, if it's in a powder form, you mix it in a tank, you can see on the, in the trailer there, a, slud, a slurry tank, mix it with water, make sure that you don't, you know, poof up the, the powder into your face when you do that. And then you just spray it over evenly over the dugout. And that's how you would do it with ferric chloride. Even if it comes in a liquid form, you can add water to it. So you can have more um, liquid to spray out of the dugout. So it's easier to meter it out over the dugout. Uh, as you can see, um, these products are caustic. Hydrated lime is even more caustic than aluminum sulfate, both of which are caustic. So you wanna make sure that you're fully garbed with personal protective equipment. Like you can see the person wearing gloves and a hood and a full body suit, um, as well as a, ma a, a mask that uh, you probably can't see here. Um, but as you can see in the picture, uh, the farmers, all they need are their ball caps because they're tough. I'll give a little moment for a chuckle there. 
and I'm sure there are people at least chuckling. Um, and that's what one thing I miss about Zoom is that uh, in person, I you know I could hear the laughter. But anyways, um, you should get at least some minimal water analyses done uh, on the water so that you can determine the amount of either hydrated lime or aluminum sulfate to use or the other coagulants. So some of the parameters uh, to measure would be uh, 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 pH and that would be for the aluminum sulfate and uh, also alkalinity for the hydrated lime. Both are related parameters, pH and alkalinity. They're, they're not the same parameter, but they're related. Um, so, the, you know, you can get a standard chemical analysis that would include both of those parameters. It is labor intensive and it can take a lot of bags, especially with the hydrated lime um, to use. So just be aware of that. We used to have a fellow that went over Alberta uh, to do it. And now there's only one fellow up, way up north that would do the hydrated lime and or aluminum sulfate treatments. So that might be a business opportunity for someone, especially in a time of heat stress like we've experienced, um, water quality is more stressed and we should be expecting and monitoring our dugouts more frequently and expecting that these poor quality situations will happen more frequently now. So uh, I mentioned during the application, you have to be properly garbed and some are more caustic than others, all coagulants, are caustic to some degree or another, even ferric uh, sulfate or ferric chloride. I still have this bullet from before, you can hire contractors to do it in season, but good luck with that unless you're way up north. Uh, now, I, I mentioned I did wanna go over a little bit of the last bullet some more, each, about each coagulant has its strengths and weaknesses. So aluminum sulfate is more effective when there is dissolved organic content. So if you have water flowing through peat, you get that brown color in the dugout uh, or leaves or twigs uh, dissolved in the dugout that produces that brown color or manure runoff that has that brown color in it. Aluminum sulfate is more effective in that uh, situation. And hydrated lime is more effective when the water is turbid. So tiny little suspended particles in the water producing turbidity but each has some effectiveness in, in those areas. You can also use colorants. This is something very simple and highly recommended that you do early spring before the growth season starts, before these blooms can start to grow. Uh, essentially these colorants, it's, it's, it's that uh, they're a dye that block the ultraviolet light there by inhibiting aquatic plant growth. Don't expect it to be a save all. Um, it's one thing that may help prevent the growth of the more toxic, the most dangerous growth, such as, uh, well, which is cyanobacteria or blue-green algae, and perhaps euclean as well, the two toxic types of growth. And, uh, you know, you, you may need to retreat after a month if, if a runoff or if a runoff has, has occurred, the dye can dilute after a while and be not as strong. Uh, one of the people, Randy Eamon, the dugout dude, he sells a dissolvable plastic baggie that's in with within another plastic bag. So you remove the dissolvable bag or the baggie, put a glove on because there's dye that, you know, br breeze through the dissolvable bag and do not open the inner bag. Otherwise you will have to join the blue man's group and learn to play the pipes because it will, it will color you blue like a Smurf. It's so into the middle of the dugout and let it dissolve. So easy, so cheap. I think he was selling them for $25 a bag. Yeah, and I mentioned to, to apply it before the growth season occurs. Now, moving on to aquatic herbicides. Uh, these are contact herbicides, sort of like the herbicides you the, the farmers spray on the crops. Uh, um, this is effective on many submergent and emergent aquatic plants. Uh, again, these are plants. Um, it's in the commercial bland, brands, you'll hear about a Reglone A and Reward. I do have contact information and some label application for Reward, handy. And uh, that, but they are not effective on most types of algae. So I mentioned they're effective on many plants, 
but not on most types of algae. So again, you have to make sure to identify what your growth is. Uh, and you have to make sure that the products are approved for use in Canada. Uh, if you were to, you should consider this to remove the plants physically. This way you don't, you're not applying chemicals or, uh, you know, things could, that could harm the aquatic life of the dugout. And you'll also be removing nutrients out of, the, out of the dugout. So it's almost like purifying if you, and some people I've talked to do physically remove the, whether it's duckweed or algae, they have different devices to do that. Down in the States, it's even worse than the, there's a lot more work that's done on physical removal of algae or plants. So then this removal of the nutrients, uh, uh, you know, prevents or helps to prevent the probability of a future growth of, of something else, maybe. A lot of people do want a magic bullet. Sorry to say, but there is no magic bullet and there is no free lunch. Uh, it, it's a hard, hard thing to accept, but it's true. Um, you know, you have to put a lot of work into those best management practices I talked about in, uh, in part one and don't expect that one simple and inexpensive thing is going to fix everything. Some products for sale may not work in many situations, even though they have glowing testimonials. Sure, well, we can all read, we've all read a lot of things on the internet. We all know that 99% of what's on the internet is true, but there's that 1%. Of course, I'm being facetious, but um, yeah, beware of what you read on the internet. Uh, and again, you have to gather uh, the necessary information before you can make an informed decision. Moving on to dugouts for fish. Just checking the time. We're good for time. It shouldn't take too much longer here, but this one is a little longer than the part one. So hopefully there'll, there'll be enough time for questions. You know what? I do see some questions. So um, I'm just going to answer some questions. I just noticed the chat. Normally I don't follow the chat, but I'm just going to answer these questions before you move on to dugouts for fish. First question, what does a fountain do for dugout water quality? Well, a fountain can help introduce some oxygen into the dugout, but it's nowhere near as efficient uh, for introducing oxygen into the dugout as compared to the membrane diffusers. It also will help uh, cool a dugout off. And in an emergency, it can be used for a fish dugout. Well, actually in an emergency, if you see your fish are dying um, or there's a problem, you could throw just a pump in the water to spray the water up in the air. I would only recommend that in emergency. It's a, it's a waste of energy, I would say. It might be nice for aesthetics, but we don't recommend them as far as uh, you know, us in Alberta agriculture goes. And if you have a follow-up question on anything that I'm answering, please feel free to follow up. So someone asked, what is bluestone, what is bluestone and what does it do? Bluestone is that granite or copper product that I talked about, most forms of which are no longer registered for use in farm dugouts or in, in most all dugouts, except for maybe some municipal dugouts. But uh, so it is used, I, I only, I, I try to stay away from it as much as possible, the use of copper, but it's for only, I recommend it for only for cyanobacteria or blue-green algae and only the registered form of bluestone uh, granite or copper, which is right now I only know is available from a co-op if, and you may have to order it in. With a, will a copper treatment kill fill, fish? If it's high enough, yes, it will kill fish. So, in, and I'll be talking about that in the fish dugouts here. Good question. How does barley straw help? Some people have talked about throwing a barley straw into the dugout for treatment. Um, but I do not recommend it. It's gonna dissolve, it's gonna, it, sorry, I just saw the Smurf comment. Sorry for the interruption. Um, uh, so it's gonna add nutrients in the dugout. Uh, PFRA, federal government did a study on it that it, it really is not worth it. It can present some problems and probably doesn't do much good at all. So avoid the barley straw. And I'm not gonna comment about the Smurf. Okay, so um, uh, moving on to dugouts for fish. 
uh, as far as the regulations goes, oh, I was going to change this bullet. Not too long ago, um, Alberta Agriculture used to inspect the Douglas, but now Alberta Environment and Parks inspect the Douglas. So please note that change. Um, the Douglas are now inspected by Al Alberta Environment and Parks, the, Alberta, the environment side of AEP. Uh, you can uh, have a dugout in a waterway where fish can escape. Um, in some situations, you may need to install a screen, if deemed so, by an ins inspector to reduce the risk of, the risk of escape. Uh, there is some in information available on the rope. And, sorry, I, I didn't change this. It's, we used to have our Alberta Agriculture website used to be called Rope on the Web. It's now just called Open Government. All government websites are in this open government system now. But we do have a website on uh, licensing for fish dugouts, and Kelly is going to send that out by email after the webinar. And there, well, there were workshops available. I guess I should remove that bullet because I'm not sure if there are any workshops available now. A lot of staff have been reduced in the government. So, but but at least a dealer, a, a, a private dealer, can help you, guide you through the process. So they will be your contact now for helping you guide you through this process if you haven't stocked fish before if you want to ask questions and they can answer a lot of questions so if you just check on the internet for uh, aquacultural dealers that the people who sell fish for use in dugouts they can help you um so i just want to talk a bit about water quality for the fish uh, oxygen is the most important uh, parameter uh, dissolved oxygen is the parameter, what you're going to be testing for. An aeration is necessary. It must be constant. That means the power grid. You can't just have a windmill because when the wind dies down, the oxygen will drop and it will take a long time to get the oxygen levels up again. So it's best to be on a dependable power supply, the power grid. Um, but if, if you're checking your, if you have a solar system with batteries and good wiring, checking it every so often, make sure it's working, you could, you could get away with a solar system or a dual uh, solar and windmill. Make sure you have those batteries operating though. You should have your aeration system well, running well ahead of time before you put the fish into the dugout to bring the oxygen levels up and test it, make sure your dissolved <clears throat> oxygen levels are acceptable. You should invest in a dissolved oxygen meter. If you're going to be having dugouts for fish, this is you know a pretty simple decision to make. They're inexpensive. You can get some more inexpensive ones. And I would even recommend this uh, in general, even for dugouts, not for fish. If 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 it's for livestock, for example, to keep you know to make sure that you're you're not going to run into a water quality problem. Uh, as I mentioned, if you if there's an emergency, if your aeration system has failed, uh, you can throw a pump in the water and just like the fountain question, you can uh, shoot the water up into the air and, you know, rather than taking the time to install an aeration system, you can get that, uh, you know, the, the water cooled off and uh, water, you know, uh, uh, air getting into the water more quickly and the, the fish will probably hover around the top. They might gas from air up at the surface as well or near the surface. And so where that water is being pumped out up and onto the surface, back onto the surface, they, the fish will congregate there if the oxygen is low. When the weather is hotter, it has, it's, uh, water is like a sponge. Um, so it can absorb oxygen, but when the water is, the weather is hotter, it's like the sponge is being squished and it can't absorb as much oxygen. So the, that's why the, there'll be angler restrictions in hot weather. And you may notice, I went fishing in a river one time and I saw in a very short dead time, 10 dead fish on the shore. And there was about a billion sea creatures died on the West Coast uh, during that hot weather stretch there because of the lack of oxygen in the water and the heat stress as well, but mostly the lack of oxygen. So if this happens, you may have to stop feeding your fish for a while. When you first get the fish, you should, you know, put a little bit of water from the dugout into that uh, tank that they're in or the, the container that they're in when you get them. 
And so you'll slowly acclimatize them to that, the new water by, you know, at, introducing a little bit by bit over a period of time. Be aware that some dugouts, if, if you haven't stocked them fish in the dugout before, they may have high salinity. So that's another reason to get your water tested. And some are fresh, freshwater fish, they do not like salinity. As well, salinity can, so salinity can run off overland into the dugout, or if you have a groundwater dugout, it could seep in through the bottom or sides of the dugout, the salinity and present water quality problems. If some fish are dead, if you notice a few fish are dead on the shore, it's likely that there are a lot more that you haven't seen if you've stocked fish in your dugout. Uh, you can get tests done uh, for the water quality at a private lab, but you should purchase your certain, at least minimal kits, such as the temperature, dissolved oxygen, pH, and salinity. At least those parameters, you should have your own testing kits to do that. Uh, you do need to maintain your dugout to keep as acceptable conditions. You can use the general maintenance practices that, that I talked about in part one, but you should also be aware that, you know, fish are more susceptible to certain conditions than, than other uses are. Uh, if you're going to clean the dugout, remove the fish before you clean the dugout because you're going to create a turbid water, which is problematic for the fish. And then you should do a coagulation treatment, which is also going to harm the fish. So remove the fish when you do that. You can reduce treatment applications. So someone asked, will copper kill fish? Yes, it can kill fish. It's harmful to aquatic life. So you can try to use those spot treatments at a lower rate. It is possible, lower percentages of like 40% 40, 40 of a normal dose. And, and you know, try one treatment, may not do it all the time, then later on, because the copper will eventually fall down to the bottom uh, sludge layer. You can try at, uh, adding another treatment. Um, some people may ask if you can eat fish in dugouts. You can go, you can check out Alberta Environment Parks and Alberta Health Statement. But if you're not eating the brain, skin, uh, you know, any of those or any organs of the fish, if you're just eating the flesh part of the fish, uh, it's likely not going to have any toxin accumulation in, in that part. You can read further on the website about that. Uh, if duckweed covers the entire surface of the dugout, oxygen levels can be depleted, natural aeration can be prevented. Again, you should have an aeration system though, but, but if the duckweed dies off, and I'll be talking about this in a later slide, I'm sure, then that can create a real problem for your water quality because the decomposing bacteria will be feeding on the duckweed and it can reduce, drop the oxygen levels in one day. Hopefully that your aeration system will be able to at least provide a pocket in the dugout where the fish can congregate to for to breathe. So there, there was a fact sheet here about target quality. I'm not so sure it's available anymore on the internet, but I do have a copy, but it goes over the, you know, the basic parameters that you need to make sure that are within acceptable conditions. Uh, so you want to meet that target quality. You want to get initial tests done before you stock fish in it, and then at least minimal parameters ongoing, like those four parameters that I mentioned, temperature, dissolved oxygen, et cetera, pH. Um, I already mentioned about the copper harmful to fish and the spot treatments because of the question that was raised. As far as the design of the dugout goes, the deeper, the better, at least a minimum of 15 feet. I know people have gotten away with a little less than that. Beware of predators, birds, fish, and mammals. Um, they, those blue herons, can, you can make a, a few blue herons very happy. They are really efficient at, at harvesting the fish out of your dugouts. Uh, and, and, you know, you don't want the the mammals in there that'll eat the fish. Plus they also destabilize the slopes, making holes in your dugouts. And, you know, it might seem a little heartless, but it depends on how many fish you're losing as to how much you spend on control, because you can spend quite a lot. You can put a lot of these wire grids up to prevent blue herons, et cetera, but it can get a little costly. So you'll have to make a decision about that. Hopefully you'll be able to see this fact sheet online, but. I'll try to remember to send Kelly the fact sheet she can attach in the email. 
for predator control. Uh, continuing on with maintenance, uh, to, when you inspect your dugout regularly, it should be done. Uh, you should check and see if your slopes are be, being deteriorated by mess, muskrat, muskrats or cattle or sloughing if there's a higher percentage of sand. Uh, and you should check to see if the water has a color, like a brown color or a dark black color. Is, there's, is it turbid? Does it have algal or plant growth? Does it have a smell? That smell, you know, if it's a, slip, a swamp smell, it could be an indication of a low oxygen. Check if your aeration system pumps and intakes are working. Sometimes a compressor can fail, for example. Are the buffer areas damaged? Um, so if you, you know, if you make sure that you properly site the dugout and, and have proper design uh, specifications and construction, these can reduce problems later on. And Kelly's gonna send out a list of reference materials, but I just list them here. Again, the quality farm dugouts the, uh, on the Albert Agriculture website, that manual, the fish culture license website that you're gonna receive and the open, there's a lot of fact sheets on our open government website for Albert Agriculture. A lot of these, are linked through the rural water quality information tool that I showed you, as well as federal government fact sheets. But if anyone has questions, now is the time to ask them. And I see there were already some good questions. I don't, um, there might have, oh, there was another. Um, sorry, it says, what if you have 25 plus dugouts? I assume it's in refer reference to uh, aerating and managing them and maintenance of them. Yeah, um, that is quite a, uh, an operation there. You will, okay, so you will be spending, you should be spending, you know, a lot of time maintaining if you're using them when you're using it. And before, if you're going to be moving your cattle onto it, go pre-inspect it ahead of time. You can get monitoring devices. Uh, so you can either get a notification through your cell phone uh, for, for your pumping systems, if your pumping system fails, you can get a notification through, through your cell phone, or you can have a light. If you can, if say, if you only want to be driving down the municipal road, looking at your dugout, you can see a light warning. If your pumping has system has failed, if there's some failure with your system, uh, there are, are those systems available. Um, it is sort of an open-ended question about 25 dugouts, but I would definitely spend some time monitoring and maintaining the dugouts, make sure you're staying on top of the problems before, um, you know, before they happen. Uh, and sorry, the, the just derailed me. Um, uh, there was one other thing. Yeah, pre preventative means like, you know, those dye, those dye packets, make sure you get on it right away. And the, there's a fall inspection that you should be doing before the winter comes and then a spring inspection. Those are two of the most important inspections for some of these aspects that I'm being seeing. So for example, in the springtime, when the ice thaws, you may end up with a, because the ice has been preventing natural aeration, you may end up with a black water that has low oxygen. So you'll be wanting, wanting to look uh, about that. Have I missed any other questions, Kelly? Uh, no, but I do have one for you. Okay. Um, we're currently installing a diffuser and aeration system on our dugout. Um, and so it says like the diffusers only last a certain number of years um, for maintenance of them and to be able to check that it's working. Is it best to stick like a rope to it that you can pull it up or how would you best maintain your diffuser? Yeah, you, you should have a rope to be able to pull it up. Now, I know the stone aerations um, have uh, the stone aerator uh, pucks have um, have uh, they do have been known to have grown a, a slime bacteria on them that can plug up the stones. I've also heard about the um, the other mem the rubber membranes that can become waterlogged. Some are better than others for doing that. I know that some aren't. You know, somehow have not developed problems like others have. So yes, a rope system that has flexibility in the line should be installed so you can pull it up for maintenance. I don't know what specific problems they've had, whether it's 
or if it's a stone or rubber membrane diffuser, membranes, I would say, are superior. You know, try to try to get a good quality, although I can't tell you which uh, company would have a better quality one than the other. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, um, there was another question that says, what's included in fall maintenance? Uh, maybe I should have said fall inspection or monitoring. That would have been the better um, be better way to state. That's what I meant to state. So inspect the slopes, the, all those things that I talked about in the, the, the monitoring or inspection of the dugout. Inspect the slopes, see if your aeration system is working. Uh, if you had a heavy weed growth the year before, I mean, you might be able to harvest it. If the weeds are growing quite long, they will die off and fall back into the water for potentially you can get that black water in the spring. So try if you can. I know some f farmers do this. They harvest those weeds. They cut them off and remove them out. Make sure they don't wash back into the dugout. So to remove those nutrients for the cycle of growth come time into the spring or even late fall. Uh, those are some examples, you know, just make sure every, there's no problems that you see. I'll just read this question here because we don't use the dugouts in the winter time. Should we plan on testing and treating in the spring before cattle or out on pasture? If yes, how much needed time needed prior to the cattle going on pasture? So um, testing, yes, inspection, assessment in the spring and that dye packet in spring. But, and, and, and if you do have a brown water, like sometimes you have, you know, a manure type of water that, that, um, that comes from spring runoff, and this is quite common. You can do a coagulation treatment, aluminum sulfate would be the best, or the one-two punch, both hydrated lime and aluminum sulfate to balance the pH out in the end. That can get time consuming costly. So if it's only one, use aluminum sulfate. That, can, that treatment can be done in the spring, but other treatments such as for cyanobacteria, for example, which is the most problematic growth you're gonna have on the dugout and most co common problematic growth. Uh, you can't really do that until the growth develops. So there, there will be, there may need to be some reactionary treatments for that cyanobacteria. But do that as early as you can, try to catch it right away. So that's why it's important to monitor the dugout frequently to catch it right away. You know, human health problems, if it catch it earlier, it's better than later on. Some of these mature growths are very hard to eradicate if they're allergy growths. But generally, even a mature, cyanobacteria growth or blue green algae growth, you can do a reactionary treatment more effectively than a weed-like growth. Um, so the time needed prior to cattle going out on pasture. Uh, a co so if you're adding chemicals for coagulation treatments, uh, it doesn't, I mean, might be a week for a herbicide treatment, <clears throat> a week for after the treatment of, of coagulant will be sufficient before the cattle go on to pasture. But if it's, if it's for treating, uh, using copper treatment uh, on cyanobacteria, which normally doesn't happen in the spring, it's only later when, the, when temperatures get hotter that the cyanobacteria or blue green algae will grow. You need to remove the cattle after the treatment with copper for blue green algae at least for a period of at least three weeks. So those toxins can degrade in the sunlight. Uh, another question. A Aquamark, uh, WSP, why are they recommending twice a year? Um, sorry, I'm not sure what that question is referring to. WSP is an acronym that I'm not sure. Is this a company that has a certain product for sale? If so, I haven't heard of Aquamark. I could, I could do an internet search for it, which is normally what I do when a person phones in. If you want to phone me, uh, tomorrow afternoon, I will be available. Actually, um, I'm just gonna type my phone number into the chat here, by the way. This is my cell number, since I'm working from home right now, but not for much longer. So there's my cell phone. Now I'm gonna see if there's a follow-up to this. I think there's more typing in that. Aquamark is a dye. 
oh, oh, why are they recommending twice a year? Well, if a runoff occurs, the, the water will be diluted. Also, it just, you know, it, it wanes in, a, in strength of the dye and the dye will prevent, help prevent photosynthesis. So you do need to re reapply this dye every so often, depending on the dugout. You, and you may need more dye if it's a larger dugout. So that's why they're recommending it twice a year. But if you have a big runoff, you may need to throw it in even you know, more frequently than just whatever twice a year. Good questions. Yeah, and just to reemphasize, so it, more than ever, we need to be checking our dugouts, uh, monitoring them and make sure, sure that we don't have any of these problems. Cyanobacteria, blue green algae being the worst problem that you'll need to be monitoring for. Again, I've had the most calls of cattle deaths uh, from Alberta and Saskatchewan than I've had in a long time because of that heat stroke, the, the heat wave we had, I mean. Very good, it looks like, I think I've covered, did I miss anything? No, I think that was fantastic. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, everybody should be getting up a follow-up email in the next few days with all the uh, references um, as well uh, as any other information that we uh, kind of gathered from uh, these presentations as well as a link um, so that they can rewatch the presentations as well. So I will stop recording.